This is Into Healing, and I'm your host, Mira Adura. Today's Into Healing guest is Tammy Lynn Kent. Tammy is a woman's health physical therapist, founder of Holistic Pelvic Hair, and author of beloved books Wild Feminine, Wild Creatives, and Mothering from Your Center. After giving birth to my twins, Tammy helped me move through some unique challenges I was facing postpartum and brought energetic healing and closure to my past miscarriages. Her work is holistic, hands-on, and guided by women's own bodies, a practice she believes should be standard in women's health care. I could not agree more. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us for more transformational healing stories. So let's start at the beginning. How would you explain what you do to someone that's not familiar with it? Mm. Um, well, I think now I know more what I do, but I kind of found my way there. So uh, it started accidentally, like so many things, um, where I was just working on the female body, kind of like a mechanic as a women's health PT, helping women with different kinds of problems they were having, symptoms, things like that. But when I would sit with the female body, I would just feel this incredible power is probably the best word for it. And I felt kind of in awe of it, but wasn't sure how to relate to it. And um, really eventually came into more, I would say, reading and speaking the body's language and receiving information from the body. So it's almost like the body became more the guide. Mm -hmm. So in... Uh, you know, more relational rather than working on, working with, mm -hmm. working with the body. And I think the closest thing it resembles to me is Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. which um, is a very relational type of healing where you're taking the body's pulse, you're listening to the body, you're receiving information to the body. So you're not just stepping in and starting to work on the body. Mm -hmm. You first take note and you listen to what the body has to say. And from there you start to move. Mm -hmm. So if you grow up in a Western culture, it feels foreign <laughs> to operate in that way. It certainly was foreign to me, having been raised in a Western culture and also studying a more medical model type of a profession, uh, which also can have their benefits. But just for me, I, I never even occurred to me that I might listen to the body. So uh, it really was a profound shift that started subtly and then became really the guide of my work. So I would say I listen and read the body and from there, create a treatment mm -hmm. um, that is very relational with the body. And one way that I talk about it, just for people to understand, is it's kind of like feng shui for the body, where you're mm -hmm. working with um, places where there's obstacles or blocks and finding flow, but really based on what the body needs for that support. Mm -hmm. So in your private practice, mm -hmm. you've seen thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of women. You just mentioned yeah. over 15,000 women. What healing are women looking for when they come to you, and how do you help them with their physical and their energetic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as a women's health physical therapist, so that's my kind of my official professional title, and that is a physical medicine. So physical therapy is a physical medicine where you're working with muscles and alignment of joints and things like that. And usually there's different techniques. And in women's health physical therapy, one of those techniques is an internal massage technique where you're literally working with the pelvic muscles. And there's kind of different... Uh, theories on how you work with that, so I won't get into all that, but um, one of the most powerful ones is the internal massage. And it's kind of like the jaw where we hold a lot of tension in our jaw. We hold a lot of tension actually in all the diaphragms, the breathing diaphragm, the pelvic diaphragm, and that's multi-layered. One is stress, one is not living rhythmically in the way the bodies hold, not being close to the earth, sitting a lot, you know, so there's reasons that we have that. And then you can add in trauma and other things. Um, so the massage is something that we should just receive as women, everyone. And so part of what I do is educate what does actually women's health look like? So, you know, women come to me because I am known among women and they talk to each other. So that's how women come in now and they seek all kinds of things. But one of the things I do is try to train healers and also talk to women about what is women's health care? What actually is that? And for most women, the only thing we think of is a pap exam. Uh, <laughs> and a breast check, you know, and both of those are looking for problems. And yeah, I think, you know, so many things are just, we just kind of come into them and we think that's normal. So, you know, pap exams, there's, a, <laughs> we could say a lot about those, but. I mean, it's so violating. They're right? so violating. <laughs> the, one of the first ones I had as a 19 year old woman was a male doctor making sexual 
jokes while he did it. And I think people don't realize how many times there is stuff like that that has happened to women. And I didn't know any so better. Normalized. I didn't know what was happening. And most women dissociate because it's very uncomfortable, cold metal, et cetera, the stirrups. So that's that's what we think of as women's health care. And so my experience of working with the body and first working in a hospital as women's health PT and seeing women with issues, so bladder leakage, prolapse, reasons that they went and sought out women's health physical therapy, the first thing I thought is why aren't we taking care of this sooner? Because a lot of the times when I would work with their bodies or do the massage, when you when you become good at working with your hands, you can kind of tell when something's newer and something's mm-hmm. older. These patterns had been there for long, mm-hmm. long periods of time. So my question, being curious, was why aren't we doing this earlier? Well, a lot of it's how the system of healthcare is set up and what we think of as women's healthcare. Mm-hmm. So for me, I always hope that women just come in whenever they want to, just for the support in their bodies, because the internal massage itself works. It w- congestion creates a lot of problems uh, in the pelvic floor and body because you get there's powerful hormones there and they build up and you don't get good flow. And it's actually part of our immune system. So this is something we don't mm-hmm. even get taught about. Like the vaginal space is actually part of your immune system. It clears things out, it's supposed to. And so instead we have all these packaging, with all this perfume and all this stuff that's super toxic, toxic. and to smell better. And then you're absorbing that into your body, which is mm-hmm. all probably carcinogenic. So, um, so to me, they come for many reasons and they may come because they have symptoms or they may come to connect with their body or they've heard about what I do or they've read something or, um, they, you know, want to just experience the healing. So it doesn't matter how they come. Every time someone comes, the first thing I do is teach them about their anatomy and talk to them about what real care looks like and talk to them about the benefit of the massage for clearing things. This is something nobody knows, nobody talks about. <laughs> you know, and so pap exams are, are there to detect cellular changes, right? And some of the things they've noticed is that in younger women, things like HPV and, and viral loads that are there clear up more quickly than in older women. And so they suggest doing invasive the medical model is, is do invasive procedures like colposcopies where you're cutting some of the tissue out for older women, but try to let it clear for younger women. But we could ask the question, well, why is it clearing for younger women? My answer would be probably the congestion hasn't been there as long. Mm. So there's more flow happening. So why don't we actually just change how we're, create more flow, Mm. do massage, teach women about their bodies, about what they could do in this space to help it flow better. And some of it is massage. Some of it is just lifestyle patterns. It, you know, it's why I wrote Wild Feminine because uh, also when you live your life a little more attuned to your center, you're going to take better care of yourself in many, many, many ways. So, yeah. And then women do come to heal trauma too. I think it's a missing piece. Um, we do a lot of our trauma healing, especially around sexual abuse through um, the mind and through therapy, which is very valuable. And there's the body imprint. The body. And how do we address that? Sometimes it takes um, you know, direct contact within a really knowledgeable, supportive presence. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh, yeah. and then postpartum. Oh, <laughs> totally. yeah. oh, that's the whole thing too, when you give birth to a baby. I, that's the other thing, we don't really tend mothers postpartum. You give birth, massive changes, energetic, physical, and so, and um, even if nothing yeah. went wrong, there's still yes. trauma. The body underwent huge, it's trauma. huge trauma. Yeah, and I think I maybe didn't fully answer your question. There's a physical component where I do internal massage. The energetics for me are through kind of guided visualization and breath. Um, on a medical model, we could call it proprioception. People can feel into a part of their body, and actually, when they have more sentient feeling there, it increases the chi. It actually increases the blood flow and the warmth. So I'm working energetically, but a lot of that is through presence, the person's presence, guided presence, mm-hmm. and breath, and um, and feeling that space. So it's a combination of physical, energetic, mm-hmm. and again, it's 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 related to Chinese medicine. I feel when mm-hmm. I because I love acupuncture and I get it. And there's there's a level of that where you're working, you're using needles and herbs to work physically, but you are working on the flow, mm-hmm. the flow patterns in the body. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey as a healer and how you found your calling? I was a young woman who uh, was good at science. And so found my way into college and and studying science. And I felt drawn towards health, but every time I would go towards what what my um, mentors would suggest, which was the medical model of, you know, being a doctor. If you're good at science, you want to be the top of your field. So you want to be a doctor. 
and I would I did some um, observation and clinical rotations or, or watched with um, some doctors and was so um, sensitive that when I would go into the hospital and be around the care, it would actually make me feel physically ill. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew that I probably wouldn't be a very good doctor, mm -hmm. at least in the way it was being practiced. Mm -hmm. So something in me kept guiding me towards uh, physical therapy or something that was more hands-on and a little bit more gentle mm -hmm. and just really following this this quiet voice that was different from where I was being guided on the external realm by mentors where I think the, the focus was on achievement mm -hmm. and uh, being successful in a certain way um, and whether that was monetary or visibility and so um, it was really through that inner voice that kind of guided me. And it's the same thing that came up again when I had a baby and was practicing as a women's health physical therapist. So this is fast forward a few years, but it, you know, he's 23 now, or almost 23. So it's like still a ways ago. Um, I left the hospital setting where I was practicing women's health physical therapy because I felt like there could be a different way to do it that might be more organic than the way I had learned because I was mostly seeing women later in life that had significant pelvic issues. And when I had a baby and felt into my body and the changes, it felt like we could be doing the work more holistically and more um, earlier. And so again, following that inner voice, even though I did not know where I was going, I didn't have a model to look to, I followed it to a, just opening my own practice in, a, in an office that I'm still in, and everything kind of organically evolved from there. So somehow, and I, I always hope that people can find their way back to that internal wisdom, because that's really, that's the root of the feminine is, is the inner guidance, not the external. What do you love about what you do? Oh, well, that's easy. Um, I get to really witness the power and beauty of the female body. It is a center point we all come in through the female body. Every one of us comes in through this place, through the portal in the womb, in the female body, um, regardless of how you express your gender, this is where you come in. And so it's a very powerful place that I think in some ways there's a forgetting of that. And certainly in a patriarchal world, there's a deliberate dishonoring of that power for many reasons. And so what I get to witness is the beauty and the power of that coming back online for women in front of me. And it serves a role in their healing, but it also is, it's powerful to witness on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly where all the work I've done has come from. So I would say like the books and the work I do is not from me, it's from that relationship to that powerful creative place where everything originates. Mm -hmm. Um, how does what you do combine ancient wisdom and modern science? Mm. That was a question I asked myself too, because I, when I first started working, I obviously came from more, still a medical model, even though it was a somewhat more holistic version. I had still, I think, a mental approach um, to the body. And so the ancient to me is more body-based and there's some how that we need to bridge that, or I felt that because I would work with women, I would work on their bodies and I would feel that there was something there that they needed that we needed, but we weren't necessarily accessing that in our modern lives. So we would get into this, we would drop into this kind of um, timeless space, you know, it was kind of like the healing field, but in the womb portal, in the pelvic bowl, you know, it's it, there's something, if you've ever been around birth, a uh, birth that goes gently, it's, there's, there's an unfolding, there's a magic that happens. Well, that is possible in the female body, even just tuning into it. But in general, most women, myself included, were quite dissociated, mm -hmm. dissociated from that place. And so it's like, you go and drop into this and then get up and go back to the mm -hmm. the working world and the lives that, that didn't allow us to move rhythmically, that didn't allow us to hear our own centers. Certainly, like when I had my first baby, that was the first time I was really home because I'd mm -hmm. been in an academic world and working world and home was cold and I didn't know what I was doing. And so it's how do we bridge that, right? How do we bridge that energy, that essence, when our lives are more complicated in many ways and certainly built on structures that pull us away from that center. So the ancient part is the contact with the body and maybe we lived more simple lives at once upon a time that were a little more rhythmic and a little bit more centered in the home or the family, um, the earth. So, but yet we need that, we're craving that. So 
a, a lot of what I do and a lot of my motivation to write like Wild Feminine, for example, was I know there's applications for this in modern time. And so it was a puzzle for me. How, how's that going to affect my work? How is that going to affect my relationships? How is that going to impact my daily rhythm? And there's many, many, many ways. Um, one of the most basic is just living seasonally and trying to incorporate that a little bit more or living from one center so you can even hear your own center. Um, to do your own healing work as, as self-responsibility so you can be a better citizen and more whole citizen in the world. You bring up the word center a lot. Can mm -hmm. you just explain a little bit what you right. mean by that right. with people who aren't familiar with it? One of the best ways is just talking about myself where I, I certainly learned the model and the culture I was raised in that academics was a way to success. And so I became very mental and achievement oriented and grade oriented and was headed that way. And all of that is external. So mm -hmm. that doesn't come from me, that comes from what do I need to learn to get the grade? Mm -hmm. And a lot of our world systems, well, in Western culture are built on that. And what happened for me is, another example is I didn't really even see color. I didn't, I, I had become almost monochromatic in my operating, in my life and how I was. And so when I started to wake up to my center, the first thing I felt was pain and grief. Mm -hmm. And which is for a lot of people because of the absence of the, mm -hmm. you know, the pent up things that were there for me. And I see this a lot in my work where we're coming back and it feels cold and lonely and isolated. And it often has to do with childhood wounding and, and you know, gets into complicated territory. But the thing is, if you come there and then you start tending it, it's like mm -hmm. a plot of land that you realize, oh, I didn't know I had this. You start tending it, you start working from it. And it is a, it's an energetic point. It's a frame of reference. You know, it's an internal point. It, meditation sometimes I think gets into it, but it's like coming to your own center and starting to find out what's true for me. How do I feel? Where's my guidance? And somehow that tiny little spark was in there when I was trying to form my career. But um, as I you know, have three sons and as I raised them, one of the points I really tried to help them find their center and stay in their center, regardless as they went into the school and they went into the work um, world, it gets lost, you know, mm -hmm. because the frameworks really pull us out of our center. And I think the pandemic pushed people back to their centers a little bit. We started to see where we'd lost touch, you know, where we live in ways that maybe aren't congruent with our own centers. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's a, it's a body point, it's an energetic point, it's a reference point, it's a way of life. Mm. How do you define healing? Mm. And what does it mean to you? Mm. I think healing is very personal. I'm not sure I could define it because when I sit with someone, they're coming in usually to heal, but there's a thousand ways that people are doing that. And there's a thousand things they're wanting to work on, you know, and it's very personal, it's very individual. And I think the biggest thing I would say is that hopefully that person, any person for healing is getting in touch with maybe where they lost track of themselves or maybe where they feel fractured or maybe they don't feel like they can show up in their fullest expression. And then the healing would be the recovery of that, but how they do that could really vary. And sometimes it's like a puzzle mm -hmm. where it's you, you see different people to help you and you go about it in your own way. And also people are very different in, you know, whether they're visual or they're um, auditory. They, you know, auditory or they're sentient or there's just, you know, I think that's where I think of it as a creative project. Mm -hmm. That would be probably- So the, many different ways yeah, to heal. Yeah, I think we think of it sometimes also in negative terms. And to me, it's like a brilliant creative project. How are you going, how are you going to heal? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how are you gonna heal that feminine fracture so that you can be more in touch with true feminine masculine balance in your life? You know, that's like a, and sometimes at some point someone has a healing crisis or something where it just, it's like they can't hold it anymore. They have a breakdown. You know, the body's language, the, the body just goes quiet. You know, it just, that person isn't listening. It just goes dormant. And the language of the body is um, slower and it's less word oriented. So a lot of times I start with people actually just trying to hear it because it is so dormant to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I support people in their, wherever their process is with that. Sometimes people are surprised at how much they can hear and receive. Sometimes they ask a question and they hear nothing mm -hmm. and, or see nothing. And, uh, and, and I say, you know, wherever you are, it, it's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. If you have a friend that you left way, 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 way back in the, mm -hmm. you're going to have to reestablish a relationship, you know? So for me, it's quite rapid now, but I spend a lot of time not only hearing the body's language, which is more simple and image-based and people will say, oh, is that that all? And I'll say, yeah, that is. The, the body might say like, 
rest. What do you need? Rest. You know, people are like, is that it? <laughs> it tends to be less <laughs> complicated. But rest is actually a high art. You know, to actually actually rest and be nourished in rest is a whole mm -hmm. project. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask you the following question, but now you just made me think of both the body says no and the body keeps the score oh, and right. how our bodies kind of yeah. have these imprints yes. that happen. Can you yeah. speak a little bit to that? Because I think yeah. it also it connects to the language of the body. For sure. I have sat with probably 15,000 women at this point. So you can imagine the trauma stories I have heard, mm -hmm. felt. I know a lot about trauma and how mm -hmm. to move through it. And so when I work with women, oftentimes the imprint is kind of stuck there, meaning, especially in the case of, say, abuse or deep trauma in the pelvic bowl, a woman comes to connect with her body, so she wants to connect because she's dissociated, and then she comes there and it feels bad, so she pops right back up. So why would you want to connect with a place that doesn't feel good? But we can actually, there's ways and techniques to kind of move that. Some of it is speaking the body's language. Some of it is proprioceptive awareness and really bringing someone into a felt sense that they are in present time. Be surprised at how many people are walking around. Actually, part of their body is still stuck in the past. Mm. Um, and so it, there's ways to kind of work through that imprint so that it is no longer holding you in that way. And that's really powerful mm -hmm. to be able to Yes, feel into the imprint, but then change the imprint, it, yeah. upgrade the imprint, put in the beauty, you know, because the medicine is also right there. There's a lot of medicine in our bodies that we can access. Mm, that's so. going to be my next question. <laughs> so I love how you use the word medicine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when speaking about the wisdom mm -hmm. inherent in our bodies. Mm -hmm. Can you say more mm -hmm. about how our bodies are medicine? Yes. When I started working with the body in a more relational way, my language changed because I realized my own relationship with my pelvic bowl, for example, I didn't know the anatomy, which most women do not. When I when they sit down with me, I sit with a pelvic bowl anatomy so they can actually see it because you can take better care of something you can see. But I my relationships were mostly kind of clinical, mm -hmm. like a pap exam or a, you know, it's like I had this very clinical view of my own body. And um, what I started to experience as I worked in more of a relational way with the pelvic bowl was the beauty, the power, the spirit, the the joy, the medicine, mm -hmm. and the way that no matter what someone had been through, no matter the trauma story or whatnot, the medicine was still intact. Nothing could fracture that. Mm -hmm. It was very powerful, but it would sometimes fracture a woman's connection. Mm -hmm. So she would leave her body, but you know, the healing potential, the chi, the energetics mm -hmm. is still there. Mm -hmm. There is medicine in that bowl. And also women tended to be in the families, the grandmothers and mothers were the medicine keepers. They were the ones that gave the medicine mm -hmm. to the family. That was something patriarchy really took, mm -hmm. put it externally. So there's a reclaiming that happens when, so I changed my language and I started using words like pelvic bowl and the energetics of it and the creativity and the medicine. And it, it it's it's subtle but profound because women have have these subtle and yet profound dissociative layers with their bodies where they don't think of them as full of medicine, mm. right? The the healing lies outside rather than inside. So interesting. Mm -hmm. huh. Do you think that's because of the systems or do you think that there's other reasons too? I mean, if I was going to break it down, I would think it's patriarchy. I mean, I, I think, and patriarchy isn't a person, you know, pa patriarchy is sort of a systemic situation that happened. I guess it happened all around the globe. And, you know, probably many reasons for that, but a lot of it was oppression and control, mm -hmm. control of power. Mm -hmm. And well, colonialism, colonialism. You know, when you talk about relationship with yeah. versus relation or over, power over right. or relationship over, right. I mean, that's, that's what colonialism is. Right. Did. And we all have those patterns in us. So it's sometimes so subtle, we don't realize how we're still acting it out or how we're living it even in our own bodies. And there's so many ways that I kind of, as I tracked back through these subtle layers for myself and with, with the women I was serving, I realized how much we kind of almost denigrated our own bodies. You know, with, um, there's so many ways that can happen. You know, one is the repression of sexuality. The other is hypersexuality, um, but without embodiment. Because it, 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 one can be present and be sexual, but a lot of times, the way it's happening is a dissociative way. And then it's sort of trying to get value and love. Mm -hmm. So there's so many subtle patterns. Another subtle one is through menstruation. And um, there's some change in this, but there's still so much uh, subtle shame that girls go through mm -hmm. when they're bleeding. 
And it's why in the TED Talk I did, I shared half the TED Talk was how I talked to my sons about menstruation mm -hmm. and not in a clinical way. I didn't sit them down and give them a <laughs> clinical discussion. Um, and it wasn't even what I would call like a feminist way, you know, it, like it was a very feminine way in that they were little boys and they would run into the bathroom, which is how, you know, children are, right? And they would see that I was getting a pad or something. And instead of like shutting the door and saying, get out, you know, it was like, oh yeah, I'm on my bleeding time. And they would sometimes when they were little, grab a pad. Mama's bleeding time. Yeah, yeah, I'm always bleeding time. They would grab a pad and use it as like, you know, a shield or a sword, you know, cause they were playing. And it was just sort of an organic way of of allowing it to be part. And, and then, you know, when they got a little older and I talk about this in the TED talk and they would say, ooh, I would say it's not ooh, like this is actually a really powerful layer that feeds us all. And it was just, Gentle, I've already started feeling that with subtle, my kids when the ooh comes out, how to reframe it. How to it. reframe it. And when they were older, for me, it was, you know, women, when they bleed, it's it's hard. It's hard to get up and go to work. It's hard to get up and go to school. Please be loving. Please be gentle. Some of them have cramping. Like when you're with partners and you have like, be loving and gentle and respectful with them. Be kind. You know, it's just. What a it, gift that is. That yeah. <laughs> well, and it was just this subtle layer that then came into um, probably how they, I hope, how they relate to, to women. Mm -hmm. And um, yet so much of the focus is on what we teach girls about bleeding. And, you know, certainly that's part of it. But also boys, the layer the all of us when we go into the womb, our first sort of experience is in a menstrual layer. Mm -hmm. And if we have a shame response to it, we're actually shaming a part of our own okay, coding yeah. without even realizing it. And we're dissociating mm -hmm. from that, which is not not, not beautiful. And, and that, that's an example of the patriarchy. It just, it's in there subtly all over the place. And mm -hmm. so re reframing that, reclaiming it. And yeah, and, it, and in the TED Talk, what I talk about is how one of my sons, um, that I bled overnight, old Portland house, toilet not working, and um, a, a boy, they had a sleepover with like a 10-year-old boy, and he ran, my son's friend ran into the bathroom and saw the blood in the toilet and screamed and said, someone died in here, you know, and, and I heard this happening, and my son ran in with him and then was like, what, what, what happened? And he said, oh, that's just my mom's bleeding time. And I just... When I heard that, I realized this other little boy had no idea that women bleed. And, <laughs> you know, that translates. Mm -hmm. That translates. Um, and certainly people are going to be intimate at times and someone's going to be bleeding. And how are they going to respond to that? You know, and are they going to be respectful and loving or is there going to be a little attitude or just kind of gross or, you know, those things matter. They matter. And, and it's all over the place, that kind of imprinting where we can have an opportunity to repair or those men become fathers of, of daughters who go through the vulnerability. It's it's hard unless you have a female body to realize what it's like to go into school during the time when your body's changing and you feel really awkward and you're no longer a little kid, but you're not yet a woman. And it's just so awkward, which I know it is for boys too, but girls have this added thing of blood actually coming out yeah. and on their pants and other things. And having and five minute break to go to the bathroom. To go to the bathroom to and then, oh, you know, do, tampon and what do I do? And, you know, it's just, it, uh, you know, there, there's a, sometimes a pride and an ownership, but there's also just a lot of vulnerability in that. Um, because we don't give permission for bodies in these systems like schools. To be bodies. To be bodies, to bleed and have needs. And, you know, all of that is part of the repair. Yeah. I love when my kids uh, fart and they're like, I farted. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's like, I know. It's so true. Because what am I going to do? You know, know. it's like, know. yeah, you farted. Yeah. It's yeah. quite funny yeah. that you farted. Yeah. You know, like bodies yeah. are being bodies. Yes. This idea of yeah. like shutting them down. Yeah. We're so oh, good yeah. at shutting down There's our so bodies. There's so many ways that we can internalize shame. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of it is, is in our families first. Oh, so. my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Can the patriarchy be healed? That is a good question. And, you know, hearing that makes me curious even more, what is the patriarchy, you know? Um, I know the impact of the patriarchy. Certainly I've seen it in the bodies and in trying to be a mother and bring sons into the world. Um, I'm curious how it even got rolling, you know? Because sometimes when you want to heal something, you almost have to understand the origin more. So it first thing it does is it bring up question, brings up questions for me where I'm probably going to ponder that a little bit more deeply and think about what is the origin of that and how did it get rolling? 
I think, I think it can be transmuted. Um, and I think part of it is maybe it will transition as we each heal the impacts of it in our bodies and our lives. Um, it's something that I certainly see, I see how my life has changed by stepping out of patriarchal patterns and not that there aren't still many subtle ones running my system that I have to keep watching, but I think maybe it's just recognizing the patriarchy as, as an energy that runs when we allow it, mm -hmm. as an operating system that runs when there's places for it to go. And the more we open our eyes to the ways it's running our systems, our structures, our bodies, our energies, our families, our relationships, the more we can start to kind of shine a light on it and begin to shift how we're running. And thus, maybe that is how it will shift is it won't even have an access point anymore. And the feminine is certainly part of it. You know, the feminine is very powerful. So understanding what the feminine is, individuals, it's a quest I went on when I was in the body, which is where I wrote Wild Feminine and things like, what is the feminine? And, you know, we defined it, but maybe everyone has to look at what is the feminine for them in a non-gendered way. What does it feel like? How do they work with it? How do they embody it? How do they heal the places they lost touch with it? What would that look like? And there might be some real individual processes that come out of that. And then there might be some collective ones as well mm -hmm. for people in different spaces, certainly for men too, I think, to sit with that and, and work with it. Um, I once read somewhere about how, and I don't know if this is the source or the origin of patriarchy, but I once read that it might have started with the first conquest mm -hmm. of land mm -hmm. and then conquest of woman, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and just this idea of dominate mm -hmm. over, power mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. how do we go back to mm -hmm. power with instead right. of power over? Right. right, You know, and maybe thinking about all our relationships, all our, I mean, relationships to our bodies, okay. relationships to other people, like how can we be in mm -hmm. relationship, mm -hmm. in real relationship mm -hmm. to each other instead of mm -hmm. dominating right. whatever it is in our right. life. Right, and I think when you say that, I also hear ownership, which is, you know, it became this thing where I have to own. And But again, that comes when we have a devoid of the feminine mm -hmm. because we feel a vacancy. So somewhere in there, the feminine got oppressed mm -hmm. and in someone that then started rolling, thinking, I need this, I need this. So wherever I see that ownership, you know, whether it's of land or of, of um, organizations or it, it, even just someone needing things, right? It's like that it, it, the, that feminine doesn't, isn't getting filled up, isn't even present. And so when it's not present, we always think it's over here. Mm -hmm. Something over here is gonna make me feel better. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it relies um, on us looking at where we lost touch with that and bringing it back online. You mentioned a little bit ago that women dissociate from their pelvic goals. Are there just like simple tools or practices or resources that they, that woman can tap into? Yeah, I, I think one thing is just actually finding a time in the day, maybe you're having a cup of tea or you make it a set point where you just actually feel into your lower body and notice how often you might be in your upper body, in your head, and not really aware of your pelvis and feet. Notice how you're sitting, notice the sensations, get up and move, feel your body. Just connecting to your body will actually shift how you embody. How do you feel spirituality or divinity fits into healing? Mm. I mean, <laughs> that's, a, that's a landmine, I think. Um, I think, again, that's a very personal journey. And I think that, you know, I've certainly worked with even religious leaders in my mm -hmm. office mm -hmm, that similarly to the medical doctors that land in my office and the teachers that land in my office, they all kind of go, the system as it is, is not working. And so the only thing I can do is start with the person in front of me. And so we focus on them and their needs and their balance and what is helpful. And then from there, they can step back into the roles they hold and start to maybe move the needle mm -hmm. in the organizations. Um, I think a lot of religious organizations are finding that young people aren't as tuned in mm -hmm. anymore. And they're finding that they need to change up a little bit. So it's not that spirituality equates to religion, but 
The thing I find, and I found this difficult, is how do you impart spirituality, meaning a connection to spirit in a tribeless culture? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how we used to experience spirituality was in community. Mm -hmm. There were rituals and things we did mm -hmm. that gave us a connection to spirit, mm -hmm. whatever that looked like, right? However, it was seasonal or if it was in a passing of someone or if it was um, something that we just did at certain times when something happened, someone became a certain age or, you know, there were just these rituals and they're mostly gone um, in Western world. And so how do you impart that? And and I found it very difficult to impart it to my children. Mm. Um, you know, we, we did a few things to try to dabble in that, but it's just so, you know, I, it's yeah. a puzzle yeah. that I don't necessarily have all the answers um, to. I was listening to oh. this uh, probably a few weeks ago where they were talking about how they were talking especially about the divine, and they were talking about how, because of patriarchal programming and all that stuff, we've somehow been fed this idea that the divine is outside of us. Yeah, exactly. That the exactly. divine is this God somewhere. Yes. The divine is like, yes. we get it after we die, right. you know, all this. Right. And right. it's like, and we've yes. forgotten that we are yes. divine. Yes. Yes, and that is, so anywhere you think either the answer is outside of you, the healing is outside of you, God or spirituality is outside of you, your knowledge is outside of you, that is the patriarchy. And that's, that's why it's so system. subtle and systemic and everywhere. And we're kind of all encoding it and, and feeling it. So finding the repair for that um, is a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And yes, exactly. When I sit with women and we feel the wisdom inside, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, there was this Alouette healer, uh, he's from the Aleutian Islands, and I can't remember his name, but someone sent me his, a video of him speaking, and he said, my elders taught me that every everything comes from the womb of the universe, and women are sacred because they have a hologram of that in their bodies. Mm. And that's a really different set point, right, of the energy is in, the knowledge is in, in the women, in the portal, in the, and so it kind of shifts everything. And there's a repair happening, I think, that is personal and then collective. And mm -hmm. yes, in the, the religious structures and the, the life structures, and even just how we perceive that we are divine, that we are sacred. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is why I chose for the TED Talk title that I did, you know, moving from uh, shame to honor in the female body. And I even wanted to say moving from shame to sacred, but because of the layers mm -hmm. that become religious, the when we talked as a group about naming it, we used honor, but truly it is sacred. Resacralizing each one of us, our bodies and our centers gives us a different access point to that divine energy. And there's a fracture there for many reasons and it's worth healing. You know, uh, when I think about even just how much we know about the world mm -hmm. and the universe and that mm -hmm. we're like a little, Right. Speck. Right. How could you right. not right. feel into that there's something bigger, bigger than you at play? What are some tools or practices you do to connect with spirit in your day to day mm -hmm. life? Uh -huh. Well, um, one of my go to things that I did, I did this during the pandemic when I was finding it harder, partially because I suddenly I was home with four males, <laughs> my husband and my three sons, my college son came back home. And it, it was a, it's a very stressful time, I think, in the world. And so I just built a little um, space with, you know, medicine wheel, basically, where I put rocks in that mark the east, south, west, north. That the, the idea of a medicine wheel is it brings sacred space wherever you are. So, And when you call the practice of calling in the directions is you are in sacred space right here, right now. And that's something we can all kind of call into, you know, when we have practices that do that. So I probably, maybe not every day, but I go out there and I just do a very simple little prayer of talking to each of the directions, lighting a candle and seeing what's in my heart, you know, what heaviness I'm carrying, what things I'm noticing, what um, prayers I have for myself, my family, the world. And then I thank the directions and I go on my merry way. So it's my way of invoking a little bit of spirit energy into the, the day, you know, the other things I think are just tangible acts of care, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of mine fall into being a healer or being a mother. So, you know, they're kind of in that space, but um, I think that's just something I've always been, it's been a value to me that I feel my connection to the greater space when I'm in that mode. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, during the pandemic, I baked and cooked so yes. much for neighbors. Yes. <laughs> and that was such a big, yes. huge yes. way that I processed yes. everything that Absolutely. was happening. Absolutely. Such a um, hands on way. What would you say to someone intrigued by this, for example, you just even mentioning yeah. the, you know, but unsure how to start because it feels yeah. so far away from where they are now? Right. Yeah. Well, first, I would say that's normal. <laughs> Welcome to the world in present time. <laughs> Um, we're in Western world, I should say, is pretty dissociative. So that's the norm. So if it feels far away, that would just be a, an awareness of what's true. Um, and then, you know, it, it's it's like the, the biggest thing I'm akin to is a garden where you can't just decide you want a garden and have it overnight. You go, oh, I want a garden, you know, or I want this aspect in my life. And then you start deciding, you know, you have to do the work. So you're clearing the space and you're starting to plant seeds. And you might have to ask someone who's a gardener if you haven't gardened before. And then there's the weather and life, you know. So it, it takes patience and it takes um, working on it through time over time. Mm -hmm. And that's something when we've moved more with our mental patience is not something we generally have cultivated, mm -hmm. you know. And I would say most most Westerners aren't as patient. So knowing that and knowing that's normal and to, that anything you do will be worthwhile. It will start the ball rolling. And certainly there's resources. You know, that's why I wrote books, because for me, books were wonderful places to find guidance. So there are books that I've written and others have written that tune you more into your body and into ways to repair this relationship. Um, and that's a good way to start. Um, for me, I did all of my books as audiobooks because I felt like pe some people are more, you know, mm -hmm. walking or driving and want to listen. And I think just pulling in the resources and picking a place to start and then having it be good enough, you know, good enough. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be, you're not going to arrive somewhere. Like it's more of a journey, but it's just doing pieces and starting wherever you feel like starting and knowing that that is enough. And then the other part is relational. I think it's helpful to um, have a friend or someone else that is sort of curious about this journey so you can actually dialogue yeah, around it. Talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we learn a lot from each other when we sit in that space. Um, Wild Feminine in particular, I put a book club at the back and several book clubs have taken that together read the book with that those themes mm -hmm. are sort of like a container and it's very rich to discuss this in a group of women you know of like what is your relationship your body where did you lose track of it how do you bring it back in and you know you start to share well this is what i do and this is what i learned and it just it sparks a lot from there yeah so this next one we're going to talk about girls and boys and just kind of a bit more raising you know female bodied or male bodied um little humans. So I'm raising three little girls and I think about girls and women and our relationship to our bodies a lot. You talk about how shame is the opposite of honor and that we cannot shame what we honor. I grew up in a culture with so much shame and so many taboos. In Arabic, our word for shame is ayib. Everything is ayib. So much to be ashamed of all the time. And now I realize it's patriarchal programming that is deeply embedded in us as women to cut us off from our power. It has taken me years to shed so much of that how do we raise girls to honor and revere their bodies instead of hating, shaming, and trying to control them? Yeah, that's a massive project. <laughs> and I, I think part of it starts with the home. So the dialogue that's in the home and certainly, you know, it's a lot of responsibility, but on the mama, um, the mother, and how she relates to her own body. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but I think just that simple switch of where am I carrying shame or or walking with shame and where could I shift to honor? Even if you don't feel that way, if you start to honor it, even in just changing the language that you're using, changing the perspective, it'll start to shift. And so I think, you know, and unfortunately this is pertaining more and more to boys too, especially in a very visual world where there's so much social media. And I didn't raise girls, I have boys, three boys, but I would sometimes see them watching themselves and start to judge themselves. And what I'm noticing is the body image issues are rising for boys a lot. And um, they all see the power of muscles as part of their potency. And there's so many traps that are similar. So what I ended up doing with them is when I would see them in the mirror kind of looking at themselves, I would just say, oh, you're so beautiful. 
or wow, you look so strong or whatever. I might sometimes use their language, but you know, I consciously used words to honor their bodies, their styles, their without, you know, being too much in their space, but just casually bringing in it and trying to work with my own issues that I carried that are maybe even nonverbal mm -hmm. by turning something that felt shameful into a blessing, even in my own mental space and certainly not speaking things out loud. There's a lot of negative talk that a woman might express about herself that is reflecting those patterns. So trying to shift those are important too. So our societies are filled with boys and men that embody this toxic masculine that's hurting them in so many ways. Loneliness, depression, violence, etc. You've raised three inspiring boys. Your eldest Nick creates music from a deeply rooted, wild, powerful place. We can hear him embodying both masculine and feminine energies through his art. What wisdom can you share on raising the next generation of connected, healed, and regulated men and boys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a rich uh, goal. Um, it's so important, and yet I think the biggest thing I've taken away as a mother is that I've seen the pain that males suffer that we haven't yet acknowledged. So we want them to be accountable. We want them to be different. We have an idea of what better looks like. Um, we certainly know what toxic patterns are like. But what I witnessed being on the inside of three boys' lives was how many places they got hurt and shut down that they had to like rebound from. And, and oftentimes, to be honest, it was from women. Mm -hmm. So I, it can be that we have the idea of like the toxic male coach. And I certainly saw some of those too, who were harsh and aggressive and punishing and, and um, uh, hurtful in their language. Although sometimes the boys liked that. So I don't, it's like, you know, so part of it was witnessing, oh, there's a lot of places they get hit and hurt. Um, and denigrated too, and we haven't quite acknowledged that. And so until we really acknowledge collectively the wounding that's happening, I don't think we can expect progress without that softening and that that um, holding space. And some of that is the feminine space where we come at it from a, a witnessing, and a lot of it's nonverbal, so it's hard for them to talk about it. Also, there's a lot of coding in the male realm uh, that if you have a problem or you have something that doesn't feel right, you are a weak male. Yeah. Um, so I was listening to this live stream and um, a, a trans activist and poet called um, Elok Vaidmanon sa said, what feminine parts of yourself did you have to destroy to be able to survive in the world? Mm -hmm. And that hit me really hard. Mm -hmm. You're a big believer in the idea that all people, regardless of sex or gender identity, mm -hmm. should balance the masculine and the fem feminine aspects of their lives. Mm -hmm. Right. What does the feminine mean to you, mm -hmm. and what does the masculine mean to you? Right, right. Um, well, I love, I love Alok. Is it Alok? I don't have to say yeah. the name out loud, so it's Alok. Um, I think or it's Alok. Alok. I yeah. think it's visionaries like that that will show even further what it can look like energetically. Um, that person is a, a real embodiment of breaking apart the boxes, you know, and just actually embodying how they feel. Um, so to me, yes, these aren't genders. Uh, feminine and masculine are energies. And recovering them in my own body, working with them in the women I see, and then raising sons in this culture were all places that I found. It was a lot of growth work to try to, 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 to access, take hold of, and keep those flowing. And it's still a challenge, and I'll talk about boys in a minute. But um, for we'll me, get to that too. yeah, okay. The feminine is the ability to receive energy. Um, and receive insight, creativity, inspiration. So most artists have an aspect to that. And you see a lot of people that are in touch with their feminine actually have a lot of color expression and a lot of beauty, literally beauty, because the feminine to me is kind of like the magical child or um, it, it's like these flowers, it's beautiful, it's expressive. And so when people have it, they feel more alive male or female, or however they gender express. It's like, a, it's like a way, so when I started touching into this, I remember I was saying I was kind of flat in my color and everything. All of a sudden I started to wake up to color. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I went through phases where I was just, everything had to be red and everything had to be turquoise and everything. And I just, like my house is full of color, but there's an aspect of the feminine that is pure inspiration and, um, and delight in receiving the beauty of life, right? So it, it's a mystery. Yeah, yeah, that's the download of the mystery. So it's the ability to receive that into one's body and life is how I would describe being in touch with the feminine. 
And it is also exquisitely sensitive. It's our sen it's very sensitive, which is why so many people shut it down because it hurts because it's the part that wants to be held and wants to be touched and wants to be fed. And so um, it gets shut down a lot, especially mm -hmm. as a child. And then there's all the gender stereotypes. So, and then the masculine to me is the energy to build and create and activate and make form. So it's taking the raw energy and making things when you have them in sync. So you download and you're inspired and then you make it into mm -hmm. a life, a profession, actual creations, or you go on adventures. And so when they're synced up, um, there's a real ebb and flow too. There's like an in and an out, mm -hmm. you know, and so it feels good. So that's one of the first things I'm often repairing with people is mm -hmm. where did they lose track of one or the other? Or in a hyper product oriented culture, which I'm from, people can have the masculine act. It's like the task, the lists, you know, it's like doing, 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 doing. It is rewarded. But if it's not connected to the feminine, it has nothing to do what you actually care about. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like running on, you know, empty. And in in um, the situation of the patriarchy, it's kind of like run amok with no feminine, which is why anyone who's really downgraded their feminine either lives in sort of a kind of unsatisfied way or they can end up perpetuating denigration of the feminine and others. And that's why we have so mm -hmm. many patterns of abuse, internal, external. If we could repair that, because the other thing is when that comes in, you feel good. So if you never get that intake, you're out here going, maybe this money, maybe this sex, maybe this well, product will make sense. me feel better, but you you need this feminine access point. And, and on another level, it's brain hemisphere. So the feminine tends to be more right brain and the masculine tends to be more left brain and we need them both, right? We need them both. So, um, cause if you're only in the dreamy sort of timeless, you get lost in that. And if you don't have the masculine orientation, you're kind of like spinning and, you know, some artists can get like that where they literally cannot get a task done mm -hmm. and they can't quite like get out of that dream state. Mm -hmm. So you can get lost in that too. Mm -hmm. We all begin in the female body. Um, however we express our gender and we encode our body and our energy imprint in this incredibly creative space. So my hope would be that every human would feel their creative power, their creative potential, their generative ability, their ability to make things however they choose those expressions. It's like a flow. But I think we often label creativity as a talent that some people have and some people don't, or maybe we don't find the expression of it particularly because we emphasize learning in certain ways. So it's really something we can track back to and understand it's our birthright. And I think it's the key to the future because you can solve a lot of problems with creativity. And I do write about this in Wild Creative, the book I wrote about this that could also be called The Wild Masculine because to me, masculine energy is inherently creative. It's making things and building things. And if we feel creative, as is our birthright, then we are better at solving the problems that we're encountering, whether they are personal or in our work environments or just the world. So creativity is something um, vital. And I think it's also vital personally, because when you feel creative, you tend to feel more alive. So I think of it as a current life current. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is, one of my biggest issues with the wellness space in the West, especially, is that it's not accessible or affordable. I'm from Beirut, and many people I know in the global South can't afford basic health care, let alone healing modalities. Like Fadi Hadouazin um, has written a whole book about this topic called Who is Wellness For? How do we make healing accessible for anyone from an underprivileged background? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think sometimes when people are in survival to the healing is a luxury, it feels like. And sometimes I work with people generationally where it was like, I work with a lot of children and grandchildren of the Holocaust, for example, and some of those uh, layers of pain people really couldn't necessarily delve into. It was like almost too much. They just had to kind of survive. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure I know the answer exactly because I know sometimes people are just in their survival mode. I think it really takes different voices for one thing and speaking to that so that people start to recognize it relates to them. Like if I say something, it might not resonate with someone who is coming from a different community because I don't necessarily have that same experience. But I will say that working in women's bodies, I've worked with many women of many backgrounds and many races and many experiences. And the medicine in the center you know, of their bodies, again, in the pelvic bowl is very specific to that person. 
And I've seen, um, like, for example, layers of racial trauma where it can be, you know, we have the idea of what it looks like and where we're fractured, but when you go to someone's body, it's more specific about how it impacted them because no two people, even in a family, experience these things in the same way. And some people are called more to healing as a role. And I, I seem to work with the people that are in their families doing the lineage work and they need the tools that are there. You know, they absolutely need them. So I think part of it is just knowledge that it's even possible and part of it is more voices in those realms, you know, talking about the impact to them. And, um, you know, for me, the medicine is in the center of the body and that's something anyone can access, but how they might access it might differ. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of appropriation and commodification of traditional and in indigenous healing modalities. How do we honor and respect and give back to the healing modalities that are not ours? Mm. Yes. I think that's also a pretty layered question. And I think always one should know what they're studying and where it's come from. And if there's proper acknowledgement, I see a lot of, especially in the West, um, someone will take a course and think they own something. Mm -hmm. And so always, especially in the feminine realm, there should be reciprocity. So it's relationship based. So if you take something, you give something, mm -hmm. you don't just pay for it and own it, you know, and you can see that's a patriarchal pattern, right? So whenever people are learning something or studying something, they should know where it comes from who it belongs to, and then be able to give the proper reciprocity to it. So it's just really important to, to look at who the sources are. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't have that experience necessarily because my source is the body. So everything I know and have learned is from mm -hmm. the body mm -hmm. and the translation of the body, but I do witness that in the healing realm. And I honor that that is true, that it you know isn't properly honored. Um, you've spoken to me about how you can tell from the body if your patient is connected into community and the support and healing that mm -hmm. creates. Mm -hmm. I know in Lebanon, the single biggest thing that has kept us alive, especially in dark, dark times, has been our ties to community because mm -hmm. we don't have any support on the state or governmental level. Can you speak as to why community is important on our healing journeys and what is something we can do today to create a deeper connection with someone in our life? Well, I think... I really only learned about community through the female body and witnessing people. What happens, people will come in with a more intact pattern or more energy in their body and we would get dialoguing and it would be like, oh, they have something that other people don't. So there's, it's kind of a chi, like it's like a cold hearth versus mm -hmm. a warm hearth. You can feel it, especially mm -hmm. when you're practiced. And you were one of the examples. Is it okay if I share yeah. it? So when I was working with you and you'd had twins and you'd come back from giving birth of twins. I'd never felt anybody's body that I'd worked with that gave birth in the West as much chi around their body and fullness as you had um, after birthing twins. And you were like, oh, well, that's because I went home and I was with my mother and all the r relations. And because when I tuned into your body field, it was like warm and full and also I could just hear and feel all this almost like chattering, singing, like women's energy. And you were like, oh yeah, well that's because of the environment I was in. It was all around your field. Whereas most women that come to me after birthing twins, they would come in feeling very cold and exhausted and their energy would be really low. Um, now, when you came in, I remember you were dealing with the transition mm -hmm. of coming back here to the West where you didn't have as much sort mm -hmm. support or not the close mm -hmm. amount of support. And part of that is when I feel women like yourself that have almost a more tribal intactness sense in your body because of the culture you come from. There's just an up closeness that your mother and, and the women come to you where they are in your space holding you and loving you that in the West, and I was raised in a more fractured experience and it, people just, they think close is here mm -hmm. or there. And that's close, you know, here I'm gonna drop this food on your porch over here. Whereas I know you have a different experience of that and I could feel that in your body field. And so I've only noticed how important it is by feeling also the absence. So how we do that in, a, in people who are not comfortable with closeness is that would be a whole project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could convince every person to add one small accessible healing practice to their day, what would that healing practice be? Mm. Uh, to love themselves, <laughs> to do one act that is loving to themselves every day. What's an example? One or two I mean, examples? It, it, you know, I guess it could be Massaging like... Massaging their... 
upbeat. <laughs> yeah, or it could be going in for that extra hug with someone that they love, you know, taking a moment to actually feel it. It could be your favorite cup of coffee, but actually being really present with it. Like, I am getting to be in it. You know, it's like being with yourself and just really honoring. Like, you can, it could be as simple as a cup of coffee, but most people are like drinking and moving. And, you know, it would be like putting your hands on the mug, really feeling it and just really being appreciative that you are in this place where you get to get this beautiful drink and you get to take it into your body. I guess it would be less important about what it is as maybe how it is. Um, I think it was, gosh, who was it? It might've been Ram Das who said, when you bring someone a glass of water, how you bring that water matters. Mm -hmm. It's not just a glass of water, it's how you bring mm -hmm. it. And I guess that would be the fundamental thing. You can do anything, but if you bring it with love towards yourself with that intention, it's going to now, one yeah. of my one of my dearest friends, Kamal, always says he quotes this sentence from the Quran, and he always says, "It says every act is an act of divinity." Mm -hmm. And I always really love that. Mm -hmm. You know, what if we went about our lives that right. way? Absolutely. You know. Yeah. So bring that cup of water. It's like, what how you bring that, it. Mm -hmm. You know. So, mm -hmm. so our last question um, is: Could you lead us through a simple, like, five-minute healing practice that mm -hmm. we could do together mm -hmm. right now? Sure. Okay, all right. Okay, so just get comfortable wherever you are. And the first thing is just tune into your own center. So just take a moment and let the outer world drop away. And just take note of what's here for you. Because sometimes we're so fast moving or busy or we're external in our awareness that we don't take note of just what's in our own center. And I invite you to extend beyond yourself a little bit. Just think about what place you're in, what nature place you're in, maybe the place outside your home or the space you're in. What does it look like? What season are you in? What beautiful thing is nearby? What trees do you know? What is this place? And just sink yourself up a little bit with that so you really remember that you are part of the beauty of nature. You're part of this place that you reside in. And just take a moment to just say hello to that beauty from your own center. And then see a little space in front of you. Maybe it looks like a little garden, something that, like a little field, a little opening. And just think about what is it that you'd like to plant in this near future? What is it that's important to you? What has been maybe on the back burner? Is there something you've wanted? Is there space you want to make for your own body care? Is this something, some creative project you want to work on? Is there some healing that you're doing? Is there some thing you've been putting off for pleasure and enjoyment that you'd actually like to prioritize? Some creative project you'd like to work on? So take a moment and just think about what it is and kind of put it into the earth there, almost like you're planting a little plant. And just think about committing to that by setting something that represents that in that land. And then imagine it really taking root. Imagine it flowering. Imagine it, it expanding, becoming a beautiful thing. It could be a piece of healing or a creation or a relationship. Imagine it flourishing in your care with your focus. May it be easy. And then just in that, feel the sunlight coming down. Just allow that sunlight to come down and just really shine on what you've just set there and on you. So you really value particularly the you that has showed up and let it wash over you. It might feel like a certain color of light or it might be golden. It might have a sensation of warmth, but let it fill from your head, your shoulders, all around you and also what you're creating. So it just gives you a little boost of chi, a little bit more energy, if you will, just the way the sun does give us this solar boost. Let it boost you and receive it into your skin and your body and wherever you maybe hold back a little bit, allow more, let it come in, let it, let it wash over you and feel the warmth in your own center and throughout your body. So it's just like, this gift that you get to receive just because you're here, just because you're alive, just because you are a beautiful creation. So take a moment to just give an inner thank you to yourself, an inner acknowledgement, 
an inner gratitude, an inner loving presence with yourself. And then before you open your eyes or begin to shift, I invite you to kind of take this with you, this little beautiful seed that you planted that relates to something that's really important to you so that you make time for it, you make space for it, you put some actions towards it so it can begin to flourish. And with it, you begin to flourish. And then go ahead and begin to just shift your body a little bit. And maybe you open your eyes and move a little bit. And just remembering who you are, that you're part of this powerful, potent, creative field. It's your birthright. You're a unique and special imprint and that you are meant to express this in your own body, in your own day-to-day, -day, in your own life, in whatever way you want, even in your healing, the places that feel awkward. It's like, let that come in and let it be part of your own unfolding and your own beauty. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so grateful for you. Thank you so much. I mean, so much wisdom. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> I think you, you know, you've not only inspired me, but I think you've inspired so many, so many others with this conversation. So thank you for making the time. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful. You're welcome. <laughs> if you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You can connect with Into Healing on TikTok and Instagram for more inspirational and behind-the-scenes content, and visit our website, intohealing.com, for transcripts and other goodies. Into Healing is made possible thanks to people like you. Contributions made through Venmo at Into Healing or through our website, intohealing.com, help us bring you more inspiring episodes. This has been Into Healing with Mira Adura. Thank you for joining us.